uh, is my screen visible somebody answer it is visible to me yes so okay. many yeses for you sana so uh, her novels classify as modern fiction of variety that you will understand when you watch any of her films you will see that there is a strict code of conduct and how people talk to each other there is a lot of formality so uh, both male and female characters they follow that code of conduct which i'll be discussing ahead and her novels are called drawing room novels because drawing room uh, was an area where people used to sit and gossip during the british time as well and drawing room had small tools and women of the house girls of the house though, though, who were eligible bachelors or spinsters they used to weave table cloths and artistry and paintings and then put it on display in drawing rooms like we have our medals and trophies on display in our drawing rooms so anybody from outside who would come they would immediately understand that this house has girls in it and uh, they are quite talented and that was all that was required for women to get married during that time they had certain artistic Uh, 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 ornamentation and accomplishments to be proud of, and then show so that they could get married. And that accomplishments included uh, painting, dancing, singing, art, and uh, anything like we have in India about cooking and weaving and threading, thread works. So uh, there are recurrent themes on courtship, love, and marriage, which is taken on a lighter note, which should be taken into deeper context. Her subtle hints on gender inequality, social class structures, and differences are considered as inevitable social display. Socio-political dimension prevalent in the then English society is perhaps undermined, and domestic and personal concerns seem more important. People say that Jane Austen wrote very light and small plots with minimal exposure, but we have several novels where she has made a uh, hint towards slavery. or uh, fall of baronage rise of aristocracy so there are so many political and social uh, so social hints as well in her novels ballrooms long regency era dresses girls dressed to please unflinching politeness are immediate connotations to her name so these are some of the things that we notice when we read jane austen but we should how jane austen would have wanted herself to be read uh, she should have considered that her novels would be taken as reflective of english culture and how it curtailed women lives and their choices so once you are done with the reading you should understand that how much was allowed for a woman to experience and what she could do in that limited domain the fragility of 19th century masculinity and the expected code of manliness so we are all familiar with mr darcy and mr collins and mr willoughby so there have been several male characters and all male characters display a kind of etiquette some kind of politeness and decorum so this is a expected standard of manliness that a woman writes from her point of view the deeper context of marriage apart from the romanticized idea that it presents the relationship between marriage and education the style and craft wit and humor sarcasm and passive aggression the conversations that immediately set apart people so conversations are really integral to the plot of jane austen in fact you will notice the chapters move ahead as people start to converse and people start to gossip and comment on an incident that has happened in the last chapter a critical contemplation of characters like what we see in the popular media or how taylor swift makes her songs like a uh, love story and she portrays a prince charming that is not the exact character that jane austen actually portrayed there are several seriously ignored themes from her works like critiques of marriage implicit in sense and sensibility people have never evaluated the precedence of reason over emotion and slavery and colonialism in mansfield park miss lamb was the first character to be introduced uh, as a color as a character of color Emma Woodhouse uh, is uh, the only financially independent heroine. There are several streaks of male characters as well. Like Collins is the only uh, ma male, uh, only hero in Jane Austen who is older to his uh, wife. Even if not a feminist in entirety, she remains an intelligent, progressive women writer who contributed to the rise of feminist women writers everywhere. This is feminist tradition and literary overview. So what happens is that literary critics have attributed a feminist identity to Jane Austen by making her a representation of feminist tradition in English novels. So she is one of the early female writers. So naturally, she wrote everything that was typical of female feelings and female characters. So it is very natural for us to call her a feminist writer. 
her thematic emphasis on love and marriage have often been classified as feminist themes despite the despite the fact that love and marriage is deal so much with emotion and marriage has often been a subject of discussion among feminists we can see that uh, her marriage themes have been or, or evaluated in context of feminist readings literature does not necessarily equates feminism with the same concerns of socio political and biological domain now the rise of feminism under the social realm, realm has a interesting background about maternal deaths like there was increased rate of marital rape which led to a lot of children being born a lot of women losing their lives in the process of abortion or delivery and that ultimately led to the voicing of what were women rights so marriage was a very key concern when they talk about feminism especially because marriage exploited a lot from women uh, a lot of women rights in that context so that was how socio political dimension of feminism progressed but in literature to see how marriage is presented again we have several shades in her novels somehow literature has confined this definition as a collective classification of female novelists like i told before that just because a female writer writes something that cannot necessarily be a feminist work literature should rather classify novelist on the coherent body of opinions held by the novelist on the identity and social functions of women female images in society and literature now these are some of the critical assertions like what critics talk about jane austen uh like some of them say like i am what say that feminine and adolescent values are painfully educated in the norms of the mature rational and educated male world so basically there are men and uh the point is that before jane austen men had been writing about men and jane austen has been a very staunch critic of samuel richardson his novels pamela and clarissa talk about women but talk about women from the perspective of a man so he has established certain virtue and moral codes for codes for women and jane austen was skeptical about it that how is a man dictating everything that morality has to do with women so beginning from there that how man's world has ruled literature for uh, a long period of time let a woman decide how man should be and how a woman should be so there's the beginning of feminism in the uh, jane austen also there is a post freudian schemes in the portrayal of womanhood so when she talks about marriage she basically talks about marriage as a biological necessity and as a uh, gift from nature that is second to nature women can reproduce that is only second to nature so this capacity to reproduce and nurture children the physical movement and fulfillment bodily structures and female identity so she talks a lot about marriage in terms of psychological and feminine and womanhood dreams this uh, helen storm corsa she says that human growth in conventional image of women as uh, being with instinctual needs for marriage and motherhood again why was marriage important and why jane austen took marriage is again related to motherhood and maternity and margaret moore says that the concept of womanhood and emotional fulfillment through sexual dependency and motherhood she imposes jane austen's personality over the women in her novels and so many of us uh, because we have a very little information available about jane austen she died young she died at the age of 41 she did not marry herself she had quite two or three romantic associations but she never said yes to any of the proposals so this is a little about her that we know but most of the critics and students of literature have tried to analyze the character of jane austen through her uh, characters in her novels so margaret moore also says that uh, her novels or characters are basically autobiographical now this is how you should attempt a feminist critique of any of the text you have to take three points into consideration the first will be gender relations in the text you have to see what are the roles that men and women perform how do they conduct themselves what are their differences what are the values associated with men what is what, what is that is associated with women you'll be able to gather a lot of differences points of similarity or points of comparison and then you proceed with gender relations the second is power equations and women roles like what comes in the domain of women what are the decisions that do uh, that a woman can make is if it is finance why does it fall into the realm of a man if it is domestic and uh, if women is limited to match making if women is limited to courtship gossiping commenting so what are the things that a woman does so automatically you'll be able to understand that the power differences differentiate men and women entirely and the third major uh, thing to evaluate whether whether you watch a film or a series or read a book or even a song when you decipher songs of honey singh and badshah and you try to uh extract the 
a sexist element in it, then you can go through female experience, experience and character evolution, that how a female is presented, what are the circumstances that make her, how she evolves through the process, how much maturity she gains. So when you take these three things into consideration, you'll be able to attempt a feminist critique of any of the novels or texts available. So this is again the explanation. I have taken some of the critics here. And basically, people have associated Jane Austen's tradition of feminism with Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was a feminist who died before Jane Austen started writing. And uh, the new moralities of marriage, marriage was her concern as well. So on those lines, Mary Wollstonecraft and Jane Austen have been often com compared. Now, this is all that she discusses. These are some of the quotations that you can go through. I'll try to email this presentation to Basu Ma'am so that you can uh, go through this in detail. So both Mary, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Jane Austen focus on women's psychology. In Pride and Prejudice, uh, Austen talks about the education of women, the importance of intellectual conversation, and the intelligible and emotional vulnerability. The theme is carried forward in Nordanger Abbey and Mansfield Park and also in Emma through the characters of women who are professionally occupied. Frank Bradbrook comments that Wollstonecraft's feminism is extreme while Austen is despised accordingly. Austen has emphasized on female tenderness, biological and psychological construct at various levels. She has mentioned accomplishments and needs accordingly. Her novels are an explanation of feminist tradition of 18th century rather than the new Freudian urges to flee from heterosexual passion. And obviously, like I discussed about Richardson, she, her novels are considered an attack on proposed standards of masculine and female morality, as he quoted by Richardson in his novels. Jane Austen's treatment of marriage in her work is best understood in relation to her skepticism about male definitions of female emotion, sexuality, education, and modesty. And this is what feminism has been throughout literature, because men, has, men have written a lot about women. Even when you go through fairy tales, men have uh, made women, um, women a damsel in distress, who is all, uh, always dependent on a knight in shining armor who is, who is coming to protect her. So these were the definitions that feminist writers have long rebelled and tried to change through their works. Now I come to some of the uh, major themes before jumping into the marriage themes and marriage plots. The first important thing is social realism in Austin. The first uh, concern during that time was that England uh, England um, was in a very drastic socio-political change. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, a lot has been going on throughout the period. And women were confined at home, especially because of Industrial Revolution, there was dearth of labor and machines were performing a lot of work. So readership has suddenly become very popular. And Gothic fiction and sensational themes were much appreciated. So Jane described the probable realities through minimal plots and her, within her social class. She chose an upper middle class or middle class gentry as her topics. She did not talk about uh, novelists like uh, Charles Dickens, who talked about lower middle class or working class or slavery. So she chose her class, the class that she was familiar with. She explored parent-child relationship, dangers and pleasures of falling in love, social relations with friends, relatives, and neighbors. A deeper understanding of women's lives, experiences, and roles. Marriage is financial and emotional stability, social respect, and societal expectations, and a combination of realism, romance, and comedy. Her novels are a comedy because all these novels end on a happy note. Now, this was very integral and very interesting about the society she lived in. Uh, this is social judgment and gossip in Austenian world. Now, characters used to watch, judge, and gossip about others, and that was really normal. Precise forms of introduction and formal acquaintances. Like if you if you have seen any of uh, Jane Austen's adaptations, you'll see that the mother or an elder she makes an acquaintance between the man and the woman. They are introduced formally to each other, and then conversations begin. Relationships between young men and women are carefully monitored. Like there are steps that how can you enter into a relationship? You should be knowing each other, then you should be dancing together. You should be pro uh, proposed for a dance. And after you dance, then you realize if there's a physical proximity or not. There are 
con context where you can match or not and then you proceed uh, the man has to propose the woman and then if she says yes then he has to go and ask his uh, her father and then that is a very carefully monitored step of how relationships proceed dance floor had chaperones to watch monitor and interpret couples so there was a dance floor in on either side people were seated there just for the purpose to see that how and who is dancing well which uh, the, uh, who of uh, these dancers make a good pair so these were very common and typical of the society plots moved forward as a result of these gossips commentaries overheard conversations and rumors again this was very common in fact you'll see the jane austen's novel is more about conversation either they are talking among their siblings or they are talking among their parents and then they're talking in letters they are writing to each other or they are people are coming to meet and then they are going to meet somewhere so it's all about conversation throughout the novel letters played a significant role in propelling decisions social status was a sensitive rein the society was obsessed with social distinction so class was a very important concern that time rank is a repeatedly used word in many of her novels gentleman is another key word in her writings associated with fortune and lineage now her marriage plots now this is very important because all six of jane austen's novels end with weddings in northanger abbey readers are informed that henry and catherine were married the bell bells rang and everybody smiled that is the last line of the novel sense and sensibility concludes with a twofold that is elinor and edward are married in barton church early in the autumn and marian is placed in a new home so both sisters elinor and marian they are married pride and prejudice mrs bennet gets rid of her two most deserving daughters on the same day mansfield park ends with fanny and edmund married and their happiness as secure as earthly happiness can be in emma the titular character and mr knightley are wed with no taste for finery or parade but with perfect happiness in their union and elliot tenderness itself is married to captain wentworth in the last chapter of persuasion with only the prospect of war casting a shadow over her contentment so these are six major novels and they have uh, this marriage thing in common and this is where all the six no six novels end but the proceeding is different marriage has been treated differently in all these novels so the backdrop to marriage themes jane austen was born in 1775 towards the end of the 18th century a period that saw the forceful emergence of an english middle class so men who had not inherited land could seek pro prosperity as businessman or clergyman or officers in the army and navy so there are several characters where you see that men actually work into these professions but the point with the women was that women cannot work anywhere that they want to the gradual disappearance of respectable work for middle class women women were barred from becoming lawyers doctors politicians or judges so they were left with no options other than writing or sitting or getting married and then gossiping about everything else so with not occupations but hobbies music drawing needle work and artistic or social patronage which were considered their display and ornamentation that they used for the now sense and sensibility which she started working on before 1796 begins with three daughters plunged into poverty when their father dies and their brother inherits the family estate at the time the only means women had of bettering themselves was marriage so unless they were married they had no scope of financial security newman writes that marriage plots in her novels exposes the fundamental discrepancy in her society between its evolved ideology of love and its implicit economic motivation pride and prejudice is a wink like this the opening line of pride and prejudice uh, prejudice says that a single man in possession of good fortunes must be in want of wife but people say the contrary is true that single women with no fortune or means to speak of are very much in need of husbands so that was totally the concern that why women should get married and why marriage was such a necessity as henry tilney catherine's love interest states in northanger abbey that man has the advantage of choice women only the power of refusal so while she cannot choose for herself she actually can refuse if she finds that choice is not worthy of her which her heroines do like elizabeth has declined two proposals before entering into with uh, darcy and jane austen herself had declined two proposals that were initiated to her narrative conventions and comedy require happy endings so it was very necessary to end the novel with a marriage with a successful marriage austen obeyed the rigid strictures of the marriage plot but she also sub subversively forced readers to see the awkward reality of marriage for women 
uh, some critics argue that she does not go far enough in challenging it as an institution. Like in Pride and Prejudice, she says, uh, Newton says that Elizabeth's untraditional power is rewarded not with some different life, but with women's traditional life with love and marriage. Like Elizabeth is shown to be very rebellious and she has to choose a partner based on intellect, but eventually she ends up marrying. So there are several concerns about critics that she did not do anything else for any of her protagonists. Others like William Magne counter that Austen reworked the marriage plot to suit her own agenda. By doing so, she made the convention a vital feature of her own art and developed it into a criticism of the life allotted by her society to young women of the times. Now see how courtship, love and marriage, these three things proceeded in Jane Austen. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. Charlotte Lucas in Pride and Prejudice plans her marriage on unsentimental grounds. If you remember, Charlotte Lucas is a friend of Elizabeth. She's 27 years old. And when she is proposed by Mr. Collins, who is 25 years old, but owns a parish and is working in a church. So she says that she is 27. She cannot afford to be romantic. She is dependent on her father, on her parents. And so she needs a financial stability and love might eventually grow. So she ends up marrying for monetary dependence. Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park calls marriage a maneuvering business. So she was skeptical about marriage. But based on the above assertions, we cannot deny sentimentalism in marriage or emotional or intellectual dependence in marriage. When any two young people take it into their heads to marry, they are pretty sure by perseverance to carry their point, like she says in Persuasion. The marriageable age is anywhere between 15 and 19. A young woman was sent out or set to be out seeking adventure, seeking prospects. So once a girl turned anywhere between 15 and 19, she was considered to be eligible to marry. And the men they marry are usually older. And except Mr. Collins, she, uh, who married Charlotte, who was 27 years old. And Marion was around 17, while uh, Colonel Brandon was 35 years old. So there have been a lot of age difference and most of the times men are more mature and more men are aged than their wives. Courtship was a semi-public process acted out according to fixed conventions. Like I said before that there was a convention, they had to meet at the ball and then they were supposed to formally be introduced to each other and then how the flirtation and royal flirtation began. Proposal followed a protocol too. Girls agreed and then the man had to talk to a girl's father. A woman did not normally reject the proposal. However, Austin's heroines refused proposals at several instances. Man has the advantage of choice and women only the power of refusal. So they made use of this. Once a marriage is made, it is irreversible. A woman, a woman cannot divorce her husband. A man can under strict, extremely grave circumstances. Uh, he can divorce his wife, but then that became a scandalous news. Now, this is very important, which is uh, most of the times overlooked in her novels, female education and the act of reading. Her uh, characters, her heroines read a lot. Like if you have watched the 2015 version, uh, 2005 version of Pride and Pre uh, Prejudice, which uh, stars Keira Knightley. So she is seen in the very opening scene in the introduction, she comes with a book. So books were really important, letters were really important, and women wrote a lot, read a lot. The socio-cultural norms regarding female education was same irrespective of class. No formal education for women and no admis uh, admittance to university, no career choices or independent travel opportunities. These were restrictions that were imposed on women. But she was allowed to have her home tutoring or her own self-tutoring. Her ornamental accomplishments included drawing, music, or any other language that they were expert in. All her heroines reflect an interest in music. Now, this is a very famous line from her novel that if a book is well written, I always find it too short. So that is to suggest that people and women actually enjoyed reading books. There is always a debate on female education in her novels, like Elizabeth certainly ignores painting and music as minor accomplishments. Instead, talks of how they were encouraged to read. Of all her heroines, Anne Elliot, who she has crafted basically on her own personality, she is at 27, she is most self-disciplined, also a discriminating reader. Her speeches are reflective of her experiences. Now, after reading, we come to the uh, center, the core of her novels, that is the ball. The ball is the dance in the novels of Jane Austen. 
these ball dances are ultimate occasion for a heady kind of courtship people dance together in physical proximity for at least 6 hours or so so it was a very great opportunity to make interactions and see new people socially the most exciting event in the provincial england of 18th century followed codes of conduct uh they followed codes of conduct if a woman declined the first round she was supposed to decline all the dance requests with the particular suitor throughout the entire session maximum two dances with the same partner was allowed spectators sized the dancers as possible couples so while few people were seen dancing on the dance floor on the either side there were few elderly couples or married people who used to stand on the extreme end and then see who is good for whom the patterns of steps and movements were complex and required enough practice so dancing was one of the skills and not everybody could dance there dancing was considered one of the female accomplishments a man can only ask a woman to dance with him only after he has been formally introduced to her so that's why introduction was important men and women were introduced to each other and then they could ask to each other no stranger could approach you talking through dancing was allowed between couples so they used they made ample use of conversations during dance so as to understand each other better verbal intimacy and physical proximity proximity define comfort parameters so this is how the next step marriage was to be decided now i'm coming to the second uh, key part of my topic that is relevance and popularity or uh, from 18th century to 21st century so what makes jane austen so relevant even today So the opening sentence of Pride and Prejudice is a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. This is among the best written opening lines in all of American and British literature. Also, this novel has been in print for continuously without break for 206 years as of now. So this is such a most uh, such a demanding novel. Jane Austen died young. Her works present the glimpse of a particular social class. sibling talks letters conversations gossips her novels are full of activities piano being played tea being poured letters being written and read so there's a lot going on in her novels she has curious interest among filmmakers so much that they created a version of pride and prejudice and zombies this is a recent release you'll be able to find it on netflix we still got to find out that how much version of emma does the world still need like they are they are obsessed with emma just because she was a fashion expert and even our sonam kapoor has made a film entitled aisha which is a loose adaptation of jane austen's emma she is the only woman apart from the queen to be featured on british currency austen remains a remarkable keen observer of uh, falsity and truth her characters are still engaging they made decisions based on dubious values their wants are sorted desires and these reflect the women of our times so that is very much relevant to the characters of this age austen is a writer of comedies so happy endings become essential to her self discovery and values are really integral to the popularity of her novels you will always see that her characters emerge they mature and that is what helps her gain popularity because you can associate these characters with reality human conditions in a socio cultural context marriage still remains essential to us jane austen's guide to dating this is a book which was written in 2015 she has and she will continue to remain popular as long as we continue to marry fall in love feel ourselves judged rejected or misinterpreted she will stay so she is here to stay the reason jane austen remains relevant and popular is because she is endlessly engaging and entertaining a controlled comic and satiric genius balanced and blended with a genuine pathos and irrepressible romanticism this is by professor christy head of the anu humanities research center alongside in this slide you can see the currency from britain where jane austen uh, is imprinted on the currency i'm concluding with some of her famous quotes which will help you assert how much much of a rebel how much of a feminist she was I believe in a true analogy between our bodily frames and our mental, and that as our bodies are the strongest, so are our feelings. That is Cap Captain Harvin, a character from Persuasion speaking. Perhaps I shall. Yes, yes, if you please. No reference to examples in books. Men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. Education has been theirs in so much higher a degree. The pen, the pen has been in their hands. I will not allow books to prove anything. Now this is her rebel. This is what shows. that she was very against the idea of richardson trying to portray women 
So she wanted to take that pen and she wanted to tell the story of the women of her times. It is perhaps our fate rather than our merit. We cannot help ourselves. We live at home quite confined and our feelings prey upon us. As for men, their busy downs on behalf of home, country, friends, spared them the dubious glory of being the prey of constant feelings. So she very well explains again in persuasion that why women think the way they think and why they act the way they act. All the privilege I claim for my own sex, it's not a very inviolable one, you need to covet it, is that of loving longest when existence or when hope is gone. So she was not much against the emotional idea. She was very optimistic about love relations and all her characters seek such intimacies. So, and then again, she says she was stronger alone. She was also not opposed to the idea of independence and soul living. I wish as well as everybody else to be perfectly happy, but like everybody else, it must be my own way. The more I know of the world, the more I'm convinced that I shall never see a man whom I can really love. I require so much. This is quite uh, conventional to the women of our times. Sense will always have attractions for me. Again, reason and emotions in her decisions. It is not what we think or feel that makes us who we are. It is what we do or fail to do. I could easily forgive his pride if he had not mortified man, mine. Give a girl an education and introduce her properly into the world and 10 to 1, but she has the means of settling well without further expense to anybody. So this is the financial aspect of it. I do not think I ever opened a book in my life which had not something to say upon women's inconsistency. Songs and proverbs all talk of women's fickleness, but perhaps you will say these were all written by men. Against the, again, the same ripple that men have always portrayed women as the betrayer for most of the language and literature, even Urdu ghazals and poetries. I hate to hear you talk about all women as if they were fine ladies instead of rational creatures. None of us want to be in calm waters all our lives. But this is the rebel talking uh, during Pride and Prejudice, where she says that women should not be evaluated on the basis of their skills. Now, these are some of the suggested readings. You can go through this. And this is I end. There's a quote that is much suitable for the quarantine period. There's nothing like staying at home for real comfort. So thank you, everybody. This is my presentation. Now we can have a discussion. Basu. Basu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please take the questions from those students. Yes, sir. Yes, definitely. Yes. So, students, now that we have come to an end of the Salam Ma'am session, and she has given us. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. So uh, now that we have come to an end of, uh, you know, Sada Ma'am's session and she has given us a wonderful insight into Austin's works and uh, she has very appropriately, you know, uh, highlighted the socio-cultural context. Ma'am, not able to hear Why, Sana? Uh, is there a problem? The others can hear me, I guess. Yes, I got plenty of yeses. Uh, so, uh, you know, yes, they can hear me, Sana. Some issues may be at your end. Uh, so with this, you know, we come to an end of Sana Ma'am's uh, session and she has, uh, you know, uh, highlighted the socio-cultural context behind Austin's works, which we are quick to miss because uh, Austin has been stereotyped as a writer who talks about, you know, love and romance and marriage. So this is something that uh, we need to remember. We need to put her works back in the socio uh, you know, political context of the period in order to examine them. Now, we are ready to invite questions from our students. So, uh, students, you may unmute yourselves one by one. Uh, who will be the first one to ask how many questions do we have from this session? Yes, please type, uh, you know, uh, please type a Y in the chat box, those of you who wish to ask a question. Please type Y in the chat box and then we can invite you for your questions. Yes, those of you who have a question, who have a query, who would like, you know, uh, to hear more from Sana Ma'am on some particular aspect of Austin, you're free to put forward a question. 
Yes, Vinay Anand has a question. So, Vinay, I call upon you to unmute yourself and pose your question to Sanama. Vinay, you may unmute yourself. Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. Sana, can you hear me? Sana has sent a message that she is unable to hear anything. Oh, oh. So, what do we do? Should we type out the question for her in the chat box? Ah, ah. Sorry. Yes, so Vinay, you may, you may type your question in the chat box. It seems there's some problem at some no, ma'am said okay, ma she's unable to hear us. She has taken off her, uh, is that her headset? She has connected it and she has taken it off. Is that why? Sana, can you hear us now? Sana? Can you hear us now, Sana? No? Sana is, is calling. Hello? Hello? Yes, Sana. Oh, I cannot listen to you, ma'am. Should I join again? But I cannot hear to anybody. I am not able to listen to anyone. Queries for you in the chat box. Okay. And then, you know, make you can, uh, respond to their queries. Uh, you can respond orally because we can hear you. Okay. So you please uh, okay, check the chat I'm box. I'm trying to reconnect in case, in case I'm able to listen again. Should I go back to the link? No, 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 no problem. You just look at the question in the chat box and then, you know, you can give your response orally because we can hear you. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh, so students, please type your queries in the chat box and Sana Ma'am will get back to us. Vinay? Yes. Vinay, please write your question here. Vinayanath, you may write your question here. Others also, you know, one by one, please start typing your queries because ma'am is unable to hear us. She'll read our questions and then, you know, she can orally respond to us because we can hear her. See, ma'am is inviting questions. Vinay Anand, please type your question. Others too, you know, please type your questions and one. Vinay, type your question quickly, Vinay. Students, please type your Sir, questions. Sir, I am so typing that, you know, my question. Yes, yes. Ma'am, okay, I am I'm typing my question. Go ahead. It's quite hot at Sana's place. Hmm?
Anand, now can you hear us? Can you hear us now? You gave a response to the humid query, so I thought maybe you are able to hear us. Students, whatever you want to say to Sana ma'am, even if it's not a question, you can type it here. Uh, yes, Sana, two questions for you, Sana. Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Yes. So, Nihanika has a question audible. that Karen Shield declares Austin exploits an arch incontrovertible amiability to conceal a ferocious and persistent moral and anger. What does she mean with this? So basically, it's it's that uh, marriage themes in Austin's novel is uh, a kind of amiable projection. Like uh, you can see that she cannot deny the fact that marriage was very much significant to the society and was integral to the existence of women. And the fact remains that women want to, should get married in order to have a financial stability. But it, uh, this fact. Beside this fact, in order to conceal a ferocious and persistent moral and anger, you cannot deny that marriage was used in different shades, in different contexts. Like I said, that there were very rational decisions with regard to marriage. You find fools in love, like there's a dialogue in Pride and Prejudice that we are all fools in love. So you see that in Pride and Prejudice, she has a younger sister, Lydia, who is quite 16. She runs away and she goes and marries to Vikham. Now her marriage becomes a scandalous news. At the same time, you find characters like Elizabeth, who are who is 27, which was too much of an age at that time for that uh, era. But she's still very persistent in her choice, very uh, uh, concrete in her choice that whom should she marry. So the fact is that she exploits an arc in con uh, incontrovertible amiability. So she takes everything, how amiable her characters are, how discreet they are about their choices. And this she tries to conceal the rebel of their nature, that they were not against marriage. Ultimately, things were uh, things had to end with marriage. But how they went about it, how they uh, cho chose the choices that they made, that was very important. So Austin did not have much in, uh, in her propriety to say, but she made use of this. I hope I answered. Now, Vinaya says, Jane Austen through our work is constantly trying to point out that marriage is a patriarchal tradition that curtail women's freedom. Yet she's not rejecting the dynamics of marriage and not even suggesting any reform. OK, so nowhere has Jane Austen said that marriage. Uh, OK, so Jane Austen is never against the idea of marriage, though she herself did not marry. And uh, through her work, she is never trying to point out that marriage was a patriarchal tradition. She actually wanted to uh, point out that why marriage was taken in that regard. Like this is very typical of our society that when somebody gets divorced, we say that what went wrong with the marriage instead of understanding that marriage in itself is a concept that is based on several subversion compromises and a lot goes goes on with it like in india you can see there's a dowry system in england there was again another system of inheritance women were denied right to their property so if uh, like in pride and prejudice there are uh, six sisters but no brothers so the property immediately either goes to the husband of some of the sisters or the immediate relative who is a brother to them so the, there were several curtailed women rights. So that was taken into consideration against the socio-cultural paradigm. But nowhere has Jane Austen said that marriage was a patriarchal construct. In fact, the abuse related to marriage, the convention of marriage, why and how marriage was conducted, that was patriarchal. So marriage is a social institute. So you have to go with it. And she is not rejecting the dynamics of marriage and not even suggesting any reform. She is suggesting a reform through the way her heroines make their decisions. So she is suggesting that there are people, there are real people. Some just want to get married, so they get married. Some people are there. They are very concrete about their choices, so they differ likewise. So she isn't uh, outright a rebel in that regard, but she has some suggestions to make with respect to choices that you can make, right? As lightly said, that women, can, uh, men can propose you, but uh, women has the right to reject. 
if she does not find that proposal suitable and it still exists this is what the uh, least we can do when it comes to marriage yes that was wonderfully answered by sana i think vinay you may type your responses to sana ma'am uh there's another question i think for sana Yes, shall we continue asking? Sana, can we find a shop? Absolutely. I would suggest you to watch uh, um, Little Women. It's a 2019 adaptation, and it's available on Amazon Prime. It will give you a lot of reflection of the society then. and also uh, pride and prejudice and all the adaptations that are available you should watch the popular adaptations of these novels but you should not stick to the narrative that is shown in the film because it is basically to appeal the popular masses the novel has a lot many things other than that Okay, Srishti. In Pride and Prejudice, the character of Elizabeth and in Emma, the character of Emma are both initially rebellious, smart, and witty, but they end up marrying characters like Mr. Knightley and Darcy. Does it not seem more of political correctness? Does it not sound like you have to seek happiness in being married because that would only bring one? Does it not sound like the heroine realizes her mistake of being rebellious and eventually succumbs to the always correct? Now uh, there are uh, there could be two aspects to it. the first is that since jane austen was uh, as i discussed earlier as i discussed the story in the beginning of my presentation that uh, the publishers when they published the novel they had certain decorum attached with the uh, uh, what novels should be like but first of all people did not like any serious topic like socio political concerns to be dealt with people were already disturbed a lot was going on in the world so they wanted to read very jolly and good topics so ultimately women were left with no choices than to write about marriage and again they had to give this a happy ending like even when you go by comedies even if shakespeare writes a comedy he goes by happy ending and shakespeare is the concept of love and shakespeare ends with a marital bliss shakespeare does not much propagate a teenage romance it eventually has to have a marriage in the end uh, in most of his comedies so by that line if we go in the uh, literature co context of it so eventually elizabeth and emma both of them get married elizabeth makes her decision it is very rightly justified that first she does not like darcy because darcy had a prejudice and she had her pride so that is how the novel is and that was uh, the novel was for previously named first impressions now again first impression both darcy and uh, elizabeth they had wrong notions about themselves Uh, about each other they were not impressed initially by each other so eventually that shows the mature feelings that shows the maturity of feelings how did darcy take stand for her how darcy was skeptical because of her social class and everything so he uh, he brings into consideration all the points that has kept him away from pursuing her so in that context i find that the match was rightly made and similarly with emma because emma had one priority that she was not into much into intellectual uh, connotation she was a little contrasting to elizabeth so she chose a partner in that accord so when you go by all her heroines all the heroine has the right to reject or to choose and they make that choice on the basis of their in instinctual or sentimental value because the third option does not exist they have to get married because if they do not get married the publisher says that the women character has to die
Okay, now Ekta. Uh, Jane Austen's novels we find very sublime narrative, as if she's a third person herself speaking down at the characters playing below. There are so many different kinds of nuances in all her characters. For instance, Miss Bates, she is being described as a silly, simple woman who talks a lot. In that era, has Jane so cleverly? Uh, in that era, has Jane so cleverly shown us that those who do not have the art to conceal or were gullible at heart were looked upon as pitiful or silly people who were considered below those? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. There are so many different kinds of nuances in her character. Uh, Jane so clearly shows us that those who do not have the art to conceal or were gullible at heart were looked upon as pitiful or silly people who were considered below those. No, uh, this isn't the context there. Uh, it is basically about class and the class you belong to. People judged each other basically on the basis of class, a lot on the basis of class. Like in Pride and Prejudice, Catherine was very much against Elizabeth. She questions, she puts three questions on her. She says that how many sisters you are, how many of them have been taken or how many of, uh, of you are married. And the third question was, what do you like to do? Like, are you well versed in music and painting? And she says that I like more, uh, I like reading more than painting and everything. So people would openly question about your class, your association, if you're married or you are taken, and they, they can ask all your talents and your skills. So there was the point that they were judged. And apart from that, if there's a silly woman or if there's a gullible woman or if there's a Mrs. Jennings or characters like that who are very foolish characters, even Mrs. Bennett was a very foolish character uh, but uh, that was not like uh, pitiful or silly they were not uh, asked to look at as pitiful or silly because the undertone of Jane Austen's novel is comic like you can imagine if you watch the film you can imagine it in Indian context like an Indian auntie who goes for uh, marriage proposals who attends a wedding and then chooses a girl and then she uh, starts spying on her and that so that was a typical society that time so if you read another uh, if you give it an another reading this time then take a comic undertone of the novel novel and you will find out that there are not silly women or to be mocked up women but they are real characters foolish people like that existed in society jane austen's original title for first impressions what role do first impressions? i think i answered that question uh, shonima first impression here is when darcy and elizabeth they meet each other so Elizabeth is very skeptical in, and she thinks that, uh, am I not audible? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm right now answering to Shonima. So she says that what role do first impression play in Pride and Prejudice? Then first impression is the first meeting that Darcy and Elizabeth have. And uh, Darcy says that he does not find Elizabeth very attractive, at least not attractive enough to lure him. And Elizabeth says that she finds him very staunch, very proud, and then he's someone who would be the last man that she could marry. So these are some of the uh, first remarks that these two characters pass on each other. So with that, we can uh, assert that that was the role of first impression in Pride and Prejudice, which was later changed to Pride and Prejudice because uh, Darcy was who was prejudiced and uh, uh, Elizabeth was very proud because she has been spotted in that regard. So did I answer everybody? Did I answer Srishti? <laughs> Okay, uh, Srishti has a question. Societal institution of marriage. No, I said marriage is a society. Uh, marriage is a social institute. Like marriage is a social construct. Like people nowadays question that when you when people love each other, why do they need to get married? So there are certain things, certain norms that are set up by society. So marriage is one of this. Shaw has rightly said that marriage is legal prostitution. And that is from where the idea of feminist uh, anticipating marriage in the wrong light came from. Because in the garb of marriage, prostitution, like uh, with prostitution, I mean marital sex and marital rape had increased a lot. And this gave marriage a negative light. And so uh, 
feminists were a little against the idea of marriage, which was leading to deaths and child deaths and maternal deaths. And uh, as a fact remains, marriage is a societal construct because people have uh, evolved the system of marriage. People have led to the concept of um, whatever uh, traditions are followed in marriage. So marriage uh, is uh, in that regard a societal institute. I think I'm clear here, Shristi. Okay, Adnan, my question is, Austin did not, did her own marriage, then why was she interested in this? And at her time, there would be girls, parents who might take good decisions right in the era when Newton found gravity. She was busy with reading and we are studying her. Okay, uh, now that is your choice, how much of Austin you like. But Austin was the pioneer, one of the pioneers of feminist writers. Uh, and uh, her topic, I have rightly uh, shown that what was social realism of her time why did she stick to the topic of marriage and why would you say that marriage is something that you should not read about and uh, again there were limited scope for women and men there were different standards for men and women so while newton can discover gravity austin was left with marriage alone to discuss because that is what she saw and she herself did not get married that is her choice that is one uh, very rebellious stand that she had but uh, this does not go blank because she was approached twice and that uh, she rejected those proposals. And uh, what was the reason? We never know because uh, a, a very little biographical element is available on Jane Austen. And whatever we know about her is through her sister Cassandra. So in one of the letters, Cassandra says that uh, the first proposal was uh, a test, basically a test she wanted to see that the the one who proposed her, how much was he in love with her. So she tried to deny and he did not come back and he went away with a, a better prospect somewhere else. And the second time she was pro proposed, the guy was seven years uh, younger to her. And at that time, her sister Cassandra had a breakup, a breakup as in she had a divorce or something like that. Uh, or she was turned down. So she did not proceed with her uh, second proposal. So these were two instances where she rejected proposals and then she died very young. She died at the age of 41. So in between whatever uh, her proposals were, we never get to discover because we lack letters and evidences from that time. So maybe if there was a match, she could have got married. But uh, why marriage interests her is because society was like that. People can think of nothing except marriage. So that goes like clearly. Who had this wit? As uh, Emma often emphasizes, that she's doing a good deed by visiting Miss Bates's family. Uh, wit is actually one of uh, one of the uh, techniques in uh, Jane Austen's narration. Like people have always said that the first opening lines of Pride and Prejudice is not about what man wants in a marriage, but rather subtly hinting on what women want in marriage. So wit is a quality when you can speak about something without being direct about it. So that is how Emma uh, talks about in that sense, because Emma is considered as one of the most witty, yet the tender character, a tender, uh, an, an epitome of tenderness among the uh, heroines of Jane Austen. So her communication had been very witty throughout. So uh, maybe when you go by the narration, that is how you will proceed with it. Uh, Shonima says, how Austen depicts Mr. Bennett? Is he a positive or negative figure? Mr. Bennett is a positive figure. Mr. Bennett is the father, and Mrs. Bennett is a comical figure. And Mr. Bennett uh, is again, you can see a reflection of that code of conduct in British uh, times that uh, once they get married, then they cannot uh, part, they cannot divorce each other. So when you see Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Bennett, you find them very paradoxical to each other. But Mr. Mr. Bennett cannot divorce his wife, and he even says that he was lured by the looks, but she has got nothing else to do except for matchmaking. So at several instances, he tries to complain about his wife to his daughter, Elizabeth, and even Elizabeth mocks at her mother quite because she always says that my nerves are weak. There's a very repetitive dialogue that she tries to play the drama auntie type of element. So Mrs. Bennett in that case is more prominent. Mr. Bennett is rather shown as a silent figure. But he's not a negative figure. He is the patriarch and he is uh, the father there, which uh, kind of enjoys his silent space in the library. Uh, 
uh, Srishti, uh, I cannot exactly say that uh, if uh, if it was not about publication, she could have not written or she could have evaded the, to evaded the topic marriage because uh, uh, H.W. Longfellow is an American, uh, was an American uh, poet. He once said that while most of the writers of Jane Austen's times, like even uh, the uh, male writers like Walter Scott and people, uh, they used to write about different history. They used to write about different times. Like if they were writers from 18th century, they used to write about uh, 17th century or uh, 15th century. So um, uh, in that context, Jane Austen was actually writing this uh, of her times, of her society, of the contemporary times. So in that case, uh, H.W. Longfellow says that Jane Austen is one of the most natural and real writers. So that was the society then. So we cannot say that if publishers did not demand, she would not have published uh, issues on marriage. Because if you go by any other novelist of that era, they talk about marriage. But Jane Austen has quite dealt with marriage in detail. That's the beautiful portion of it. I think I'm clear now. Uh, Sh Shonima says, what is the importance of dialogue to character development in the novel? A lot, because in uh, a character in your real life, you judge a lot uh, through the narration they make, like the way people talk to each other, the content of their conversation is very important in analyzing a character. So dialogues are really important in the character development of the novel, because you will understand that what this uh, Initially, you see Eleanor and Mary, and these they are the characters. They're uh, they skip from one to the other until they uh, like Marion. Ma Marion has a wrong association with uh, some. Uh, I'm forgetting the name. The first association she had was uh, was uh, ended with a heartbreak, and the second association she had was Colonel Brandon. And Colonel Brandon is much older to her. So you see that over time, her conversation, her perception, a lot has changed. So in that regard, you can see that whatever she delivers, how she thinks, how she talks of these things, they eventually lead to the character development. Uh, Rishita, why did Austin change the title from first impression to pride and prejudice? I do not know if there's any reason to that, because uh, Austin actually did not write titles for most of her novels. And she changed the title of three of her novels, actually. So there might not be a concrete reason for why did she change the title, but it could be that Pride and Prejudice sound better to her, like filmmakers do. Uh, OK, Srishti says there was some part of it left in the initial part. I will mark it, but thank you once again. OK, I couldn't wish it. OK. Anafis. Uh, the Reader, a romantic drama film, came out in 2008 starring Kate Winslet based on German novel written by Bernhard Schwing. In that film, the character Hannah Schmitz, who gets into an affair with a teenager boy and spends some good amount of time with him, but later on she moves away from him, to put it briefly, realizing that she don't need him. But later by then, she commits suicide out of her loneliness, which makes me curious about how naturally men and women are interdependent. OK, uh, Nafis, uh, this is a very interesting question. Again, uh, this is a romantic drama, came out of a novel. Uh, if you're aware of Madame Bovary, this is what happens to her. So uh, writers have never actually tried to explore the sexual fantasies and uh, sexual urges related to female sexuality. So um, ultimately, it uh, happens that in Madame Bovary also, Emma tries to go to seek her own sexual fantasies through extramarital affair and ends up dying. So I think that is what they want to show the character, the obsession with a very pious woman following the social norm. And if she does not go by the social norm, she has to die or she has to end. So uh, this can just explain it right now. Uh, OK, in what way does Austin portray the family? Uh, and community as responsible for its members. OK, Nafi, since you are here, I'll uh, like to. Uh, there was a recent Bollywood film, uh, Thappar. So there are mixed reviews regarding that Thappar. But the female character it was a very female oriented film. But you find the female character is portrayed in the light of Sita. 
like she is very biased she is extremely not angry angry with her husband jo though she goes and files a complaint to part with her husband and get to get a divorce but she never explains the reason she does not even mention that uh, there was a domestic violence she was slapped so this is uh, this is a very uh, the conventional idea of why women keep hiding the flaws of their husband why women are not vocal about what went wrong with them so either either way that is what has pro, um, promoted films and novels to take such characters where women uh, do not want to be uh, uh, helding someone guilty for that case uh, trying to play a little safer trying to be maternal even when uh they cannot be and in india it's a trend to uh, portray characters female characters or good biased female characters in the light of sita so when you discuss that film it's more about even britain or english or hollywood does not have much scope to portray such rebellious characters abeta okay coming back to shonima in what way uh, does austin portray the family and community as responsible for its members okay she portrays the family and community her novel uh, her okay. novel is uh, basically very domestic so every decision is a result of domestic orientation and every uh, discussion is you can see that siblings talk to each other they converse about each other they advise to each other so family and community they play a very large role in putting everything into focus like gossips and uh, social concerns i told about so they were very integral to the existence of characters and whatever rumors circulated they helped in uh, um, propelling some of the decision some of the uh, wise's decision so i think uh, this is how family and community stayed glued to each other and this is how characters uh, never had the choice to have uh, a solo independent decision instead everybody was a part of it uh, any more questions and uh, any more doubt i, I think uh, i answered thank you shweta hope you are doing good i still cannot hear anybody but i think i am audible did i miss any question okay thank you everyone okay i tried to condense everything that i could in this uh, slide but still i am open to questions you can contact me on facebook or i'll give you my id as well you can talk to me whenever you want to Thank you, Basu Ma'am. Thank you, Yaya Sir. Thank you, Neha Ma'am. Thank you, everyone. So I cannot hear anybody. I'm reading everybody out. Okay. Hope you had a nice lecture. so we part with this hoping to meet again and thank you everyone thank you yaya sir basu ma'am thank you once again for giving me this opportunity it was like reliving the literature okay thank you so much okay thank you students for being with us yaya sir i think you can uh, formally thank our students and then we can uh, you know put an end and we can close this session today wow uh, i'm i'm extremely thankful of all my faculty members uh, in absentia i'm once again thankful of sana though she is not hearing us but we are very much thankful to her for taking time out of her schedule time it, it is actually it was her office time there and and uh, we are thankful of all our faculty members all the participants our students as well as the students of other colleges thank you very much i hope you will be with us tomorrow also we are coming up with a lecture again tomorrow uh, we will be talking on ps elia uh, and his critical idiom uh, dr priyush bala from ranchi uh, will be with us so requesting you to be with us tomorrow also yes ma'am my captions are on thank all of you thank you
थैंक यू एवरीबडी एंड वी मे कन्वीनियंटली कॉल इट अ डे थैंक यू ये सर